of initiatives and technological changes and advancements and excuses happening at DWP and a lot of frustration by its customers. Um, quite frankly, it's not just the new billing system and it's not anything new. Um, these have been um, issues plagued uh, by all the users uh, and customers at DWP for, for many years. Um, and I'm looking at a simplistic fix, and that's what our motion does, um, at least one thing, and, um, and it's called virtual hold. And there's one department um, in government that I think a lot of people feel a sense of stress about, um, or used to anyway, um, when they knew that they had to either go there or call there, and that was the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, was only, I think, second to, if that, uh, of, of the DWP. Um, I recently called the DMV, and this is what they do. Thank you for calling. All of our technicians are assisting other callers. Rather than wait on hold, we can call you back when it's your turn between 29 and 36 minutes from now. You will not lose your place in line if you choose to use this service. To receive a callback, press 1 or option. Please enter your area code and phone number followed by the pound key. Your phone number has been recorded as 2134737012. If this is correct, press 1. To Please speak your full name at the tone. Press any key to end recording. Mitchell Englander. Thank you for using DMV's virtual hold. Your place in the queue has been reserved and you will be called back when an agent is available. Thank you for calling. Goodbye. That took one minute. It was a long minute, yes, but that took one minute um, as opposed to the 30 and 45 minute holds we're experiencing now at the Department of Water and Power and also 311. Um, there's absolutely no reason we shouldn't be able to add simple things like that to make the customer experience uh, much more pleasurable and free up people's valuable time. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. And uh, thank you for bringing that uh, measure forward. I was happy to second it, largely because I had the same visit to the Department of Motor Vehicles as well. And I think Mr. Kokorian and I fixed that when we were in the state legislature. But I think you're absolutely right. The technology exists for us to be able to streamline the experience that our residents have when they interface with government. And I'm very excited about the motion and will be uh, reporting back to you what we find out today from the department. So thank you for being here. Mr. Kerkorian, you mentioned thank that you, you wanted much. to uh, hear the report first. Uh, you're, if you've got the time, we're happy to uh, hear items one, two, three, and four. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. However you'd like, whatever your pleasure is. I think I'd prefer to hear the reports and might be able to participate in the conversation afterwards if, with your permission. We, we li we'd like that very much, and I'd welcome you to the dais, of course, Thanks. if you'd like to um, sit with us while we um, hear this. So with that, can I have staff come up that will address uh, issues uh, one, two, three, and four? Items, I should say. Very good. And as staff's coming up, I, I do want to thank uh, you all for um, coming today and helping us understand how uh, the, the billing uh, and the systems related with the billing are working or not, as the case may be. I uh, authored the first motion uh, based largely uh, in part by complaints that we were getting in our district offices about incorrect billing information. So we're all very, very eager to hear about that. But as you heard, uh, Councilmember Englander is also uh, looking forward to uh, us making more innovative steps in, in realizing a better experience for our constituents as they interface with this very, very important uh, service that we provide, which is water and power. Um, and we also want to... Um, understand uh, how it is that, uh, let's see here, item four, let me just make sure that I remember here properly, is um, I want to give my colleagues their proper credit, is also another motion that I introduced, uh, trying to figure out how we can ideally get our residents onto a 30-day billing cycle, uh, largely in part because I think this uh, will provide more information to our customers and I'm a big believer uh, in that more information will hopefully help um, curb usage and make our residents a little bit more aware as to what it is that they're consuming uh, on a monthly basis and it also makes the bills more manageable uh, and so that was a measure that I wanted to uh, uh, talk about and uh, motion number two, uh, sorry for jumping around, was one that uh, Mr. Kerkorian introduced um, to speak to um, 
uh, some of the call volume and hold times and all of this thing. So we, would, we thought it'd be a good idea, Mr. Kokori and Mr. Koretz, to have items one, two, three, and four heard uh, together so we can talk about billing, and it really is the focus of today's uh, committee meeting. So with that, please introduce yourself for the records and let us know uh, all that we need to know about uh, billing and DWP. Great, thank you. We'll first go through the introductions and then we'll dive into the presentation. My name is Campbell Hawkins, the Director of Customer Operations at LADWP. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sharon Grove. I'm the Director of Customer Experience at LADWP. Matt Lamp. I'm the Chief Information Officer at LADWP. Well, great. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity to give you an update on our new customer information system. Uh, we are prepared today to talk about the short-term uh, issues that we're facing as well as the, the great suggestions uh, of, this, of, this, of this body to include the virtual hold concept. We'll also touch upon monthly billing and then we'll also touch upon some, some broader longer term strategies in this presentation. The way the presentation is structured today is we have a fairly brief uh, set of slides in the beginning, three or four, that will frame the issue at a high level. Then we have a, a detailed appendix that gets into some of the stats, specific key metrics that uh, this body had requested. And I defer to you whether you want to go through those key stats at this point or not. So with that uh, framing of the issues and, and prefatory comments, I'll go ahead and, and dive right in. Again, very briefly, the, the presentation is broken into these components. We'll give a, a brief background. I think it's always helpful to put these discussions into context. We'll then get into the current status, and then most importantly, the action steps uh, going forward, and certainly open it up to, to questions and answers uh, at the end. First, from a background perspective, I think uh, it's important to note that, and I think most of we are aware that we replaced a 40-year legacy system, CIS system, customer information system, and went live with that new system September 2nd over the Labor Day weekend. And if I'm not mistaken, this was really the third attempt to get that system in. Uh, various attempts occurred uh, uh, over time, but this was the, th the third attempt, and we got it in this time. The customer information system is really the core information system that manages the utility's meter to cash process, from the meter read all the way through the billing, the collection process, and it also um, fac facilitates some of the web-based functionality that we have today. So it is the core system. We not only replaced that core system, but because many of the complementary systems that we needed to also replace during this conversion were embedded into the legacy system, we also had to replace complementary systems in addition to this core CIS system that we replaced. So in addition to the core system, we replaced our meter reading uh, upload system our meter reader routing system, how we route meter readers through the city, and make sure that that's done efficiently, that was replaced as well. Our water trouble ticket systems were also replaced. And so this uh, implementation, and this is certainly not meant to be an excuse, that's not the reason why I'm saying this, it's just really to help set the context. This was a massive undertaking that included not only a core information system, but several complementary systems that had to be replaced in order to, and this is the key point, in order to serve our customers better in the long term. Our legacy system of 40 years was not in a position to take our business into the future as well as this new platform will be over time once it's stabilized. Today we rank 13 out of 13 on the JD Power survey of large utilities in the western United States. Clearly that's unacceptable. We needed to take some decisive actions to begin to reverse that trend to address the customer service that we all know exists today in the department and to continue to do a better job in serving our customers. This core system replacement that I was just referring to is the foundational piece to that strategy. Once we get the system stable, again, we'll provide us a platform to continue to serve our customers better. And then we'll continue to layer on additional functionality through our web and other capabilities to improve the customer experience. The CIS replacement is, is complicated in the sense, um, just on the very nature, when utilities do this for one commodity alone, it's, it's a fairly complex process. It's even uh, further complicated by the fact that today we provide essential services for four commodities. 
water power, and of course the, the Bureau of Sanitation. We are the billing agent for the Bureau of Sanitation. So we're managing four commodities, uh, deliver four commodities on the bill. And so that is another uh, contributing factor to where we are today. So to be clear, it's water power, the sewer fee, and the container fee, the four right. commodities. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. And then last uh, but not least on this slide, uh, the, the most important thing I think to highlight here is that every day and every month the stabilization period is getting better. Today we're, we're certainly peaking in some of the customer service issues that we're, we're addressing. But every day this issue has senior management attention. We're taking decisive actions to address the issues and get the system stabilized. And every day, every week, every month, it will get better. At the same time, to fully vet the system, to, to get it functioning the way that uh, we all want it to function. When you look across the, the industry standards, certainly you'll gain traction in the first few months, uh, which we expect and are already starting to experience. Longer term stabilization does, in fairness, take 6, 12, 18 months to get it fine-tuned and operating the way that we want it. So with those opening comments, uh, I'll move on to the next slide. The current status, I've broken the current status down really into two major components, uh, really what's working and, and what's not working. And certainly this is not meant to be an exhaustive list on either side of the ledger, but it does give a flavor, I think, uh, and an overall high-level status of where we are today. First, if we start with what's working, two million bills have been generated since go live. And that's pretty consistent with the number of bills that we would expect to be generated during this period. So the system is producing bills. And in most cases, those bills are accurate. Now, that's not to say that there aren't pockets, and we'll get to a little bit later on, where they may not be. But the, the system is producing accurate bills. And two million bills have been generated since go live. The revenue that it has billed or, or generated is also consistent with the revenue plan. Generally, consider, you'll see the stat there, 94.7% of the revenue has been generated compared to our plan. The customer service reps every day are getting more and more comfortable with the system, learning to navigate the new system. But again, there is a, a, a learning curve that they need to overcome to develop that muscle memory to uh, handle customer calls efficiently uh, as they encounter them on the phone. The legacy system, if you can picture this for a moment, was a, a mainframe-based system that had a green screen, kind of command-driven type functionality, where they had to literally type a command into the system in order to get things done. This new industry standard platform, which is used in a variety of utilities across the country, is much more typical with today's technology, GUI interface, point and click with a mouse. So again, industry standard brings our department up to best practices. Our web self-service capabilities uh, are stabilizing and provides an option for our customers to not only contact us via the phone, but also through various email or other uh, online channels. Clearly what's not working is the customer wait times in the call center are unacceptable. They've gone from, on average, 10 to 15 minutes historically up to 30, 40, 50 minutes today, which we acknowledge and concede is not acceptable and we need to improve and we're working aggressively to do that. The interesting point here though is that the call volume itself, the actual number of calls coming into the department, really has not increased dramatically when compared to prior years. The call volume generally is remaining flat. However, the issue is the transaction time to deal with the various customer issues effectively and efficiently and thoughtfully after they've waited uh, is taking longer and it's taking longer for a couple of principal reasons. One, it's taking longer because there is this natural learning curve where the customer service reps are dealing with a new system, getting more and more comfortable with the system, but that is taking longer. Some of the issues that they're dealing with are, are a bit more complex because of this system uh, conversion and transformation, so it's taking a little bit longer on the phone. We're also trying to be empathetic with the customers as they call because they've had to spend an extended period of time on the phone, so we are uh, spending time with them to make sure that we handle those calls uh, in a reasonable, empathetic way. So those, and, and quite frankly, as, as noted on this slide, there is some functionality in the system today that is either not 
functioning as uh, it's supposed to that we need to fix. That's, that's driving some, some, some call volumes. And we're in the process of fixing those. Uh, or we simply have realized that there are some change requests that we need to make to the system. We need to change the system functionality after it's gone line and we're starting to experience some of these calls. I, I don't want to interrupt you yep, with sure. a question, but I just had to yep. ask this because you've, you've given us a catch-22 that mm -hmm. you're having to be more empathetic mm -hmm. and take longer on the calls because you're taking so long on the calls. Um, you, it would seem that we would be more efficient just by finding a way to make shorter calls than you wouldn't need to be more empathetic and take more time <laughs> hand-holding the customer that you've ticked off. Um, it just doesn't make any sense that that's one of the reasons why we're slower because we have to spend a lot of time apologizing for being slower. Yeah. No, I understand. That point's not lost on it. We, we realize we have to get to the root cause and solve the core issue and handle those calls efficiently. Uh, so clearly I was not trying to suggest that that was the major reason why we're, the call volumes are, or the transaction times are up. It's a contributing factor, but, but not demonstrative, certainly. Okay. Some of the other uh, uh, things that we're working to improve is some of our large summary bill customers, large complex customers, like the LA Unified School District, as, as an example. Providing those summary bills to them in a, in a timely manner is um, the, the summary bill feature where we aggregate and consolidate a number of accounts on one bill uh, has certainly been one of the areas that we need to continue to improve upon. Uh, we're working on that aggressively, but some of those bills are not going out as timely as and accurately as we'd like. And then some of the solar customers, residential solar customers, the, the net metering aspect, there's a subset of the solar customers where the conversion of their, what we call the solar bank or the net uh, consumption um, did not convert uh, the way that it needed to and we're in the process of fixing that. It's a relatively small number of customers, but we are working to correct that. So again, that's just a, a fairly high level summary of where we, where we stand today, what's working, what's not working. I can take a breath if you'd like, if there's other questions, or I can keep moving. Sure. So, I mean, uh, in, in that breath, you know, on the what's not working, what is sort of the, um, of the rate base, what per is there a percentage that you can say is affected by what's not working? You know, the, the, yes, I think broadly, you know, it's certainly can, could uh, use some additional an analytics on it, but generally when we look at that at a very high level, we're looking at about 200,000 calls per month into the call center, which again isn't hasn't ticked up dramatically over prior periods. And that roughly equates to about 15% of our customer base. Understanding that some of those are repeat callers. Uh, they may not all be calling because there's a system related issue. They may be just calling for routine business. I think it's important to note there's a large percentage of our customers that are getting a, uh, their transactions handled fine. They're getting a, an accurate bill. There's no issues and, and that's included in that 200,000 number. But broadly, uh, that tries to put it into some perspective for you. And in terms of, uh, do we have uh, the analytics on what we know are incorrect bills? I mean, so you've got sort of the call volume, call center impact, but in terms of uh, actual analytics, what we know is incorrect in, the, in these bills, any idea yet on, on how many bills are out there that are incorrect? You know, I, I think... And, As and a percentage to the... To yeah, I think it's a, a, a small percentage that's really related to the estimation issue that we'll, we can touch upon if you'd like now. And inaccurate is probably a strong term when it comes to the estimation issue, although it is a bill that's uh, outside of what the customer expects. Uh, generally speaking, we bill every other month today based upon an actual read, but for various reasons at times the actual meet, it, meet or read is not available. The route didn't get com did not get completed or there's some other reason why that the actual meet or read isn't there. So we then move to an industry standard estimation process that provides an estimated bill. It first looks to, when the actual meter read is not there, it first looks to the same period uh, from a year ago to account for seasonality. If that data point is there, it uses it and it produces a bill, generally speaking, in line with the customer's expectations outside some uh, unusual event. They had solar last year, or they didn't have solar last year, they have solar now. But generally speaking, the, that, that benchmark is a, is a good, reasonable number. If that data point is not there for whatever reason, then it looks to the immediate prior billing period in the current year. And again, that's a reasonable estimate for what the customer uses. Where we've had some challenges uh, in this conversion is that not all 
and let me back up just for a second, as part of the conversion process to help this very point on estimation, we did bring over 24 months of historical usage information so that when the system looked for those data points to provide a, a reasonable estimate, that data point was there so it could provide that reasonable estimate. But there is, again, a small subset of our customer, I would say it's 5%, uh, you know, roughly, that that data point wasn't there, those two prior bill periods that I talked about. In fact, no usage history was there to look for, and so it had to revert to the third estimation rule, which was using a residential class average. So we would just take a look at the average usage of a residential consumer and use that average to build a customer. Well, that, that data point could be higher than what the customer typically uses, or it could be lower, quite frankly, from what the customer uses. And we're seeing a small percentage of customers calling in saying, hey, my estimate is out of line with my historical usage. When we hear that concern, we cancel and rebuild based upon an actual read to correct the situation. Um, I've got a lot of questions in this area, yep. so I don't know if you want to sort of start uh, with the questions here or, or continue with the presentation. But I've got one last slide okay, perfect. Uh, that, that will talk uh, at high level of the action steps and then certainly open up to any questions that you may have. The action steps, again, this is, a, I think, a fairly comprehensive list, certainly not exhaustive, of the steps that we're taking uh, immediately to address the situation, really categorized into three broad areas. The first is we've got to bring down the wait times, no question about it. In the meantime, we are taking the suggestion of this council to, or this committee to uh, implement the virtual hold callback feature uh, in, our call, in our contact center. Our IVR, our interactive voice technology, the recording that you hear when you call into DWP has that capability, that virtual hold callback capability. It's been tested, and we're on the cusp of implementing that. And we're going we're gonna to try it. Uh, I think the general consensus is we're going to try it, see how it works. And if it works, we'll, we'll keep it. If there's some operational issues, we'll, we'll reevaluate that. But we do have the capability. It's been tested. We're ready to deploy it and see how it works. CSR training and efficiency. Uh, again, it's not demonstrative, but it, it, but it is going to help making sure that they're, they're trained and have the knowledge that they need to navigate the system efficiently. We're also offering uh, overtime. Uh, we, we can't force overtime necessarily, but we're offering overtime to all CSRs. Uh, certainly it's being taken advantage of in, in a, lot, a lot of cases, but we're doing everything we can from a staffing perspective to make sure that the contact center is staffed appropriately. We're also looking at an emergency a, a, a hiring, uh, to expedite hiring of additional contact center representatives to, to bolster our current staff as we weather uh, the, the current peak capacity that we're experiencing. We've also uh, just recently um, uh, received uh, responses to an RFP that we had released uh, to help us come in and strategically look at our contact center and doing a strategic assessment from not only a technology capability standpoint, but from a, a staffing and process uh, standpoint. We're in the process of, of grading those and won't, don't necessarily want to speak too much out of school here. But we are in the process of, of, of grading those and awarding that and expect to have that in place, uh, certainly uh, Q1 next year, maybe even uh, by the end of this year. So that will help long term strategically look at our capabilities. I did mention the system functionality that we need to continue to optimize as part of this typical stabilization period that we're going through. That is very aggressively managed. We know exactly the, the type of functionality that we need to continually improve and working aggressively to solve that functionality so that we, to your point, uh, eliminate the, the, the root cause of the calls to begin with. We're continuing to align our organization. We are creating a centralized uh, training organization, which will help with the, the, the training of our team so that they, again, continue to be efficient. Where before it was a, a decentralized training operation, we're looking to consolidate that given our new system platform so that we can ensure that the training is, is robust, ongoing, and consistent. And then we're looking to increase the channels in which our customers can interact with us. We certainly have our IVR technology where they can inter interact with us in an automated fashion today via the IVR. We also have web channels. We're also looking to add third-party payment channels where they could go into leading retailers uh, across the region to pay a bill or to handle some other routine business with the department. That RFP is is set to be released, and we hope to have that capability early next year. We're also looking to add additional meter readers. We just went out on an emergency 
appointment to add meter readers. Uh, those 12 new meter readers are going to start uh, early December, which will help complete more routes, which means fewer estimates, fewer estimated bills. And again, there are some functionality around the, the meter reading capability or meter reading process that we need to optimize that we're aggressively working. As it relates to monthly billing, uh, clearly, uh, before we take this step, we need to stabilize our current system. Uh, so uh, we're not looking to implement this functionality while we are in complete alignment that long-term monthly billing is industry best practice, and we need to move in that direction. But I think uh, until we get the current system stabilized, uh, we're recommending at least that, that we delay that monthly billing process until the current system is stabilized. And ultimately, we believe that the monthly billing process does need to be based upon actual meter reads. Uh, and today, we read every other month. Uh, so until we have the capability either through more meter readers or an automated capability to read meters monthly, we're going to be misaligned with a monthly billing with, a, with an estimate process, which fundamentally, I think, needs to be addressed strategically longer term. So with that, we're taking a very aggressive action across these three fronts. We fully recognize that our level of customer service today needs to be improved. It's unacceptable. We're working across these lines to, to get that done to include both immediate actions that I've just outlined as well as the longer-term strategies that I just referenced. So with that, I'll conclude my comments and open it up to you for additional questions. Sure. So, you know, the, the burning question uh, for me at least is sort of, you know, when are we stable? Uh, but I think in order for me to understand sort of what that means, I, I still have to, I think, get a, a better grab, uh, grasp of sort of what the problem is. So you mentioned, you know, a real small slice of the net metering customers, which I have to imagine is a very, very, very small slice of the rate base. So, so there's that problem. And um, you mentioned uh, that we're taking estimates largely because we are unable to route the, the, the meter reader or... Um, I mean, why? what other reasons do we have for taking estimates? You know, it's it's hard to have these uh, conversations without getting into the weeds fairly quickly. So yeah. if, if you'd and, like... And I apologize because yeah. I, I have a tendency to want to do that because I, I just... Because part of me wants to understand, um, you know, if you have a data set and, and you go out 24 months back yeah. and, and, and there isn't data there and then you go to the preceding yeah. uh, uh, month, then you go to Rule 3, which is sort of the regional sort of estimate, mm -hmm. um, you know... In the implementation uh, of this new system, it, it sort of begs the question, why not load it with more data so you don't have to go to Rule 3, which is probably where you have the most discrepancy? Uh, or it begs the question on why, um, uh, you know, how, how much did we sort of anticipate being a problem? Because, you know, going from the green screen and mainframe, I understand it. You're, you, you know, it, it's important for us to go to scalable systems, and, and that's critical. But it, it just seems that um, there's some planning issues here that I that I don't fully understand yet. And and uh, and, and you obviously had a, a sense for these sort of default rules. Mm -hmm. um, but did we have any sense that we would get to rule three situations? And is there a rule four situation? You know, are folks out there not getting a bill? Sure. Um, help me understand the problem a little bit more. Yeah, sure. So, let me take a couple of those. Um, part of the, the thing, the, the process that leads us to the issue of data being migrated has to do with the structure of the old system. The old system was a flat file system. Basically, when you swapped out a meter, you lost its linkage to any meter history. Uh, at the same time that we were heading to go live to meet the... Um, ARRA grant requirements, we are having to do a lot of uh, meter changes. Um, and when we saw that, in fact, if we let those meter changes go through into the old system, it facilitated migrating that meter to the new system, but it also meant it came over without the history. And so at one point, we stopped letting those migrate into the system and held them to be at, so that when the new system came up, we let a flood of those meter changes go through. Um, each, each way you go had, prob had problems, but there wasn't, given the old system we had, unless we were going to spend many, many months and lots of money trying to modify it to make it move data easier, um, there wasn't really a good way out of 
the dilemma given the 40-year-old structure of data in that system. Um, so if we move the meters, if we let them then flood in at the end, um, we, got, we had to make sure that any, any issues with the meter configuration matching up properly, the field data that was put by the, the installer, any errors in that, any mismatch on addresses, all held those meter reads from coming in. So either way, we had some issues we had to resolve. And uh, it was particularly clear because we had one whole group, one whole area in the, in the valley in the Chatsworth area that were getting, were part of this pilot project for these meters. And so we had one whole neighborhood that fell into this situation. We, we observed it a couple different ways. So under the old system, um, what hap would happen is a lot of times people would get a delayed bill because they wouldn't, the meter wouldn't change, wouldn't go in well, they'd have to clean up some data. We have delayed billing, which caused issues. In the old system, sometimes they would release the bill, but without the one service being billed. So we had customers who, would, who called who, um, in July and August, got a bill for water and sewer, but not electric. Their next bill, which came out of the new system, was water, it was electric, but it was electric for four months. Okay? Now some, and sometimes that bill was estimated. So uh, it, it, even if they had good data, and a lot of them we, we analyzed, the, the vast, a lot of the estimated bills which used rule one or two were very good. But some of those bills were ones that had a meter exchange and they, they were estimating based on bad data. So it's a subset of a subset of a subset. But it relates to activity that was going on with meter changes. We also saw some examples with converted data where, frankly, with all the different meter types that we've had accumulated over the years um, and configurations, some of the configurations didn't, didn't move properly to the new system. When they tried to upload a read from those meters, they would get, those reads would get stuck. They wouldn't get in the system. So there we physically had the read. And so what happens there is if the customer calls back, we can look and see what the read was against the estimate. And if it's off by ways, we, can, we cancel and rebuild back to the last read, and they get a corrected bill. The third issue that comes up was around the routing system. Um, the old routing system was, was, um, had been built into the old CIS uh, 25 years ago. It could not be moved. Okay? So we went to an industry standard GIS-based routing system uh, for meters. And what we found was that, that um, while it's GIS-based and all the addresses that came over came over with our post office correct addresses, because we made sure we did that, because our old system couldn't hold true addresses. There was a large conversion process to move addresses over. The field literally was not big enough to truly hold a post office correct address. Um, so we would find a lot of meters that the routing software the first time on a route really didn't put them quite in the right place. We also have a lot of meters that it's actually better if you run, go down the alley to read them rather than the front. So the old system, people had refined and refined and refined those meter routes. So they knew I do these three houses in the back and I do these two in the front. The new system didn't have, wasn't that, couldn't know that. The first round, that first 60 days, the meter readers, when they're out there, would make notes. And the system is designed to take those notes back and correct it the next time around. But that first cycle, our 60-day cycle of reads, was pretty rugged on the meter readers. They worked very hard. They did overtime. But literally, they had a lot of trouble meeting their routes because the way it would show up in their handheld, go to this one, this one, this one, a lot of times didn't really work properly. But those are getting better. Every time they write, read a route now, 
those are getting better. That's the part of the stabilization process. Is the system not working as designed? No, it's working as designed there. But going to industry standard GIS-based data, unless until you really have all that data tuned, um, actually costs you time as opposed to gains time. So we're seeing less estimated bills as we go back through these cycles because people are getting, if not completing the routes, getting much deeper into the routes. Part of, part of it for us is learning to identify some of the things. That, so if it kicks something out, it ends up in a queue. It might give us a to-do. It might give us something. And it gen the system right now generates a lot of those. And part of the learning process for everybody is prioritizing, figuring out which are the highest priority things to, to get. Because some things really affect a bill and some things don't affect a bill. And getting that tuning, getting staff oriented to that, and tackling those things is part of the is also part of the stabilization process. How uh, and I'll have my, my colleagues sort of jump in here uh, after this question because I still uh, unfortunately want to get into the weeds here. But for, for setting aside, for example, uh, for, for, for for the time being, uh, the routing and how you're actually collecting the data, assuming that we, we can understand sort of the the scope of the problem, and I'm still struggling with that. <coughs> Setting that aside for a second, how do you true up with, with the customer? So you're taking these estimates, and is there a, uh, a mechanism by which you all are going to true up sort of what the real cost ought to be, and are they going to feel that, you know, two months from now? Uh, and, and, and before you answer that, help me understand, every route, every meter is read, and then uh, a bill, it's not like you're, you've got one community that gets a bill this month, and two months later they get the next one. And the, the it's, it's actually everybody close to gets that. them in the same same. It's, it's actually close to that. We have a 60-day cycle, and we have certain what well, basically routes that we read, um, sort of in in a sequence where you basically move around the city, and each route sequence ties to a billing process. Um, and they're, they're windows so that you don't necessarily, um, you have a certain number of days to get that read done for that billing cycle. And if it has the read, it, it basically holds the bill through that cycle to see if it gets a read. If it doesn't get a read, then it basically asks a question, looks at a, a variable in the system of, is this one I'm allowed to estimate or not? Right. And if it, does, if it can estimate it, it will estimate it. In the old world, a lot of those bills just got held. And we had a lot of many, many more delayed billing issues. Um, but I, I guess my question is, you know, I, I, I think, because I, I paid everything uh, online, I think I got a bill uh, in October for, mm -hmm. to be paid in November. Okay. Is that right? That would make sense. Everybody got, uh, so it's not like all customers got their November bill mailed out in October. All, no. What happened, essentially, if you think about it, as a residential customer, there's a 60-day period, and we will issue roughly, you know, 30,000 bills day one of that cycle, and every day, every okay. five days a week, every day through that 60-day cycle. Got it. Okay. So you might get yours October 17th, but there are other people who got it October 1st. So, so. Uh, now that I understand that, is, is there a boomerang effect that's going to happen here when we have to true up those bills with folks? Because presumably the ones that there are mistakes and we either estimated not enough or too much, how do you true that up? And do, is that coming in 60 days? When the, when the next uh, actual read comes in, it makes it trues the customer up from a usage perspective and it uh, makes the reconciliation on the next bill. So um, is the nature of these estimates, do we know if they're sort of higher than normal or lower than normal? Because lower means that folks are going to have a bigger bill their next cycle. Higher means that they're going to have a lower bill next cycle. Do we have any sense for what that effect's going to be? No, not, not at this time. It, it's a, again, it's a small subset of the customer base, but I don't have exact numbers and breaking it out, which is when, high, which is low. When we looked at, at samples of estimated bills and looked against you know, historic data, um, the ones that had historic data tended to be 
pretty good. Now, if this year was hotter or people turned their air conditioning up more, um, those variables you don't know, we don't know. So, you know, we know that some bills probably were a little low, some bills were a little high. Now, the ones that ended up in that sort of, um, we know that a number of the ones that ended up using that sort of third method tended toward being a little bit high. And those are ones that, you know, we're, we will be truing up. And, we've, and as we've gotten calls from people, right, so somebody who got a bill that was estimated, and we look and it, the estimated uses doesn't make any sense against their historic usage because the CSR who's getting that call can go back into the old system to look at some history that may not have moved over. It takes a little time, but they can do that. If they see it's way off, they have a way of triggering a process called cancel rebuild. It basically cancels that bill, generates a rebill using an estimate, a revised estimate that's based on what they see in the historical data. So we are doing that for customers as, as those cases are identified. But a lot of the customers, when we lo go look at historic usage, the estimate is actually very good in terms of historic usage. So will the customer ultimately have to true up to whatever actual is? Because you just mentioned the cancel rebuild, that's a revised estimate sort of process, but will the customer be responsible to true up during yeah. this period? Let me, let me clarify that slightly. Because the example I used was a et revised estimate. Sometimes what we're finding is for some of those meter configuration problems, the read didn't get in during the billing cycle, so it issued an estimate, but it may have gotten into the system a day later, two days later, five days later, in which case they see an actual, and the cancel rebill will actually go actual to actual. Um, but in terms of your overall question, yes, the next bill becomes a essentially a true up bill. They, they don't have to intervene in the process, I think, to your question. It will, once we get the next read, it'll, it'll true it up. Although, if the customer wants immediate action, they can call in and we will do an immediate cancel rebill. But, but it's not incumbent upon them to intervene unless they want to intervene. Very good. Mr. Kretz? Yeah, um, I know you've been talking about why the bills are a little higher with historic usage, et cetera. I don't know if my constituents are exaggerating, but some are calling and we're getting a large volume of calls, uh, believing that their bills are two or three times what they've been in the past. Um, what's the explanation for that being that out of scale? Is, are some of their bills two or three times what, it, what they are in the past, and how's that happening, and have we corrected that? Yeah, it, it could be. Uh, and it's, it's for the very phenomenon that we've just talked about. It's, it's how they compare to this class average um, usage it, when, it has, when the system has to default to, to that third rule. So it could be, even be that level of, of percentage it, off. You know, it's, it's, you know it's, it's always helpful to have you know, the specific uh, you know, customer accounts to be able to look at that. But certainly it, it, it could be, I think, you know, in quite you know, candor, it could be. So how, now, how quickly will we have caught those and fixed them where people haven't complained, and how quickly will we well, have responded and fixed them where people have complained? You know, as soon as uh, you know, they call in, we correct them um, immediately through a cancel rebuild process. The important point, though, to, to note uh, longer term is that now that once we get the actual read in, the system no longer has to look to the third rule because that immediate prior billing period rule now has a data point to look at. And so it's, it's every day, once the system gets more and more usages in the system, that th third rule is, becomes less and less a factor over time. So but if someone hasn't called in to complain, what happens to well, their bill that's two or three times what it should? Well, as I mentioned uh, just previously, once the next meter read comes in, actual meter read comes in, then it makes the, the adjustment on the next bill. It, it, reconciles that usage and bills them correctly the next bill. So customers, although they're obviously upset that their bill is higher, they don't, in theory, they don't really have to worry because this will self-correct and presumably we refund the amount that yes. they're overcharged and, and get everything set. Um, also, a lot has been said about wait times and my 
as my constituents would characterize it, they call in, they wait, they get transferred, they wait, centuries go by, mountains wear down and ice ages come and go, and they're still on hold and they call my office and say, what the hell is going on? Um, I think the, the uh, idea that was suggested of, of the automated time and callback uh, seems like a decent idea. Um, but they still have to wait the amount of time. They're just not stuck on the phone with you. Uh, what are we doing to correct that? And do we, do we have a goal of something reasonable like five to ten minutes that we want to permanently achieve by hiring the right number of people and adding some overtime and doing all the other things we can do? What are we doing to try and get to a reasonable number really quickly? Yes, our, our immediate goal is to get back to the, the wait times that we've historically uh, been able to achieve, and it's certainly in some of the graphics that you have in the appendix that was in the five to ten minute range that, that you referenced. And what we're doing about it is, is pulling all the levers that you just referenced. We are offering uh, overtime to all of our staff. We are looking to add additional staff. We're looking to implement the virtual hold capability. We're continuing to train our folks so that they're more and more comfortable with the system. So we're doing all of those things to, to address this particular issue. And most importantly, we're fine-tuning the system so that we eliminate the call to begin with. And, and that's, that's really key there. So we're, we're doing all of those things as, a, as aggressively as we can to address this issue. And on the callback system, have we thought through things that could go wrong? What if the person happens to get a call from their friend at the exact moment you'd be calling back? What do we do? Do they never receive a call, or do they automatically get a call again in 10 minutes? How do we make sure that they don't get screwed for using the process? You're right. We are identifying some of those very issues as we've gone through this testing process. Uh, as an example, one of the things we found in our testing process was that one customer got three callbacks. And so uh, what we're doing to try to avoid that is to think ahead, to test the process uh, ahead of time to, to before implementation. Uh, but certainly even after implementation, we may very well run into those particular issues. And if we do, we'll just have to you know, react appropriately and quickly to address it. Okay. And on the 30-day billing cycle, um, I, I see positive and negatives to that. And I don't know if we've looked at all of them. Obviously, from a PR standpoint, it's a more manageable amount. It's easier for people to budget, et cetera. Um, what's the cost to us? How much more expensive is it to us to uh, have an up-to-date figure every single month and to mail out bills uh, you know, every 30 days instead of 60 days, twice as many bills? Uh, have we looked at the cost negatives as well as the positives, and how does it play out? Uh, certainly we've evaluated that. I'm not prepared to speak at this point with the exact numbers, but we have uh, looked at that analysis. We, uh, As we went through this conversion process, we... Uh, made sure that the capability of the system uh, was able to handle monthly billing once we elected to turn it on. So it is capable of doing that. The, the considerations that we have before we go to monthly billing have less to do with the new CIS system because it is, in fact, capable of, of moving to monthly billing. It has more to do with the getting the monthly read and an absent a monthly actual read then we have to think of some other strategies, if any, before we move to monthly billing, because otherwise you may be in a situation, underscore may, but you'd be in a situation where you'd have a higher number of estimates every other month. So at the end of the day, do we think we actually save money by doing it, or, or no? Well, I, I think, you know, clearly I think one of the, the principal drivers, I don't think it's necessarily a cost-saving measure going to monthly billing. Just postage alone is going to, as you mentioned, is going to cost us more. It's really more about industry best practice and the customer experience. When you look at the, I mentioned earlier, we're 13 out of 13 in the J.D. Power survey. When you look at the top 12, they all read monthly and they all bill monthly. And, and I ask you to relate to your own experiences. How many essential services bills do you get today that are every other month? So it's, it's clearly not, I think, from a customer experience standpoint, best practice. And I think it's less about a cost-saving initiative as more as a customer experience. Well, let me just add one other comment there. Um, in those same surveys, J.D. Power surveys, one of the places that we are hit compared to other utilities is the perception of our cost. Mm -hmm. And yet, 
when you compare our rates against those other utilities, they're lower. And part of that perception issue is because they get a two-month bill that is very large and can have very large swings to it, given seasonality, tier rates, et cetera. So, you know, there's, there's an issue there that's part of it, what's the real cost and what's the perceived cost. And that affects the customer experience quite a bit. So I guess what you're saying is the actual additional cost is modest enough that it's offset by the better customer experience, that people would be happier with that even with the extra tiny additional cost. Um, as far as water conservation, energy conservation on the actual bills, have we considered doing anything graphically to encourage people to uh, uh, be better at this? Uh, I don't know, I'm thinking you know, if you were in the top 5% of energy conservers during a particular month, you'd get a little superhero logo that you wouldn't normally <laughs> expect. Uh, or uh, if you were in the bottom 1% and you were a huge energy hog, you'd actually have a, a, a little pig uh, logo <laughs> up here. To, you'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm really, it must be pretty bad for them to do that to me. Have, have we looked at, at uh, anything more out of the box in terms of yeah. graphics to uh, uh, try and encourage people and let them know when they're mm -hmm. doing a great job or a poor job of conservation? Well, the big step was, of course, doing graphics that showed being able to show the tiers and show the tier when people are hitting tier three on either you know on electric or the higher tiers on water. And we do that now. And we do we do do that now now. Three years ago, we didn't do that. That was all related to a total rewrite of, of the bill. But, but industry, industry best practice does have, and you're, that's exactly correct, it's peer pressure that causes people to use less. So you're, you're on point, and we have talked to many vendors about being able to give us this type of data. Can I go back to some of the things that Campbell's mentioned? Without a monthly data point, it's really hard to give customers a really nice piece of you know, a data set or a little pig face or whatever because they need that monthly data point, and it, it, you really forget what you did for the past 60 days. So again, we're we're really contending with all these issues now that we really have this system and the and the world is there's so many possibilities in the world it's hard to contain ourselves but there's things that we need to do first. Very good, thank you, Mr. Corian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, it's been a very good report. Thank you, and I'm uh, I appreciate uh, the chairman's desire to get into the weeds because. Subjects like this require that, and it's very easy to speak in generics, bumper sticker slogans, um, but when you really get down into the details of it is when you figure out solutions. And so I appreciate the, the um, depth of information in this. It's responsive to everything I wanted in my motion, and, uh, and I appreciate that. Been a good discussion. Thank you. Um, I do want to take one big step back from the weeds and talk about the transformation of this billing system and why it had to happen. Uh, and maybe you can speak a little bit more to that. You did initially at, at the, the outset. But um, this is a system that's been held together with scotch tape and bailing wire for 39 years with add-ons and, um, you know, no complete systemic strategic review or, um, or replacement in all of that time. And um, the result of that has been a, a lack of ability to do a lot of the things that we've known that we need to do. And monthly billing is one of them. The old system did not enable the department to do monthly billing. Is that, is that right? You, you could not do it because it was at, the two-month billing cycle was actually in grained in the system couldn't be changed without re I think replacing the I figured that it would have taken rewriting about 50 programs that are inherent in that old system and, to and, try to do that. And since this is a bundled bill, there were many other things, like problems that sanitation had in determining when, when they were inadvertently, improperly billing residents of multifamily 
uh, buildings for uh, refuse collection when they shouldn't have been, it was very difficult for them to get the information they needed to correct that because the billing came through the DWP system, which was antiquated. So I think it's important that everybody understand this in the context of this was an enormous undertaking that the department had to take and was probably, you know, a decade or so, you know, behind in, in taking. So I... I actually want to applaud you for um, taking that step and for um, uh, for taking on a, a huge heavy lift. Now, obviously, as in many important big things, the implementation had some bumps in the road, as, as you've talked about. Um, and I, I want to talk about a few of those. But um, first, this monthly billing cycle thing since we've been discussing this. Um, the mailing cost is one negative element of that. I think I, I want to say that I have in mind that it's a half a million dollars or so per mailing. Is that is that right? Okay. It, it's it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars just to prepare the mailing itself per month. So there's there's that cost. But in addition to that, there's going to have to be a significant staffing up of just the meter reading process, I assume, because you're going to be doing twice as many meter reads. You have to cover the same geography. You're going to have to beef up the uh, staffing there as well, and that's going to be a cost as well. Yes? Correct. Okay. Correct. It, it, we have to get it. To, you know, we can put monthly billing in. As I said, we don't have a system constraint anymore, as you mentioned. It's really what is going to serve the customer the best way, and that is really to get a data point every month, and whether you do that in an automated fashion or a manual fashion, that's really something that has to be thought out before we take that step. Right. As far as cost reduction on the mailing side, um, it's not really the subject of today's discussion, but I do just want to throw out there that I, I certainly hope that the department will continue the work that it has done and redouble the work that it has done to get away from paper billing and get more people uh, with electronic billing so that we can reduce some of those cost uh, elements. Um, but the advantage of the monthly billing, among other things, and I think this goes to, to Mr. Kretz's point about conservation, is when you can compare this month with the prior month, uh, prior year, same month, prior year, when you can think about what changes you made over the last 30 days and you see the result, that's going to do much more to, resp to change behavior than we can possibly do with these long two-month cycles right now. So I think that alone is, is probably justification enough to do this. And then the convenience for ratepayers who pay all their bills on a monthly basis except this one, uh, I think is, is very important. Can, uh, can I add one more, yeah. one more benefit on the cost saving side? We, you really do see, I actually implemented monthly billing at a utility in, in Illinois, and we actually saw a decrease in the bad debt. So you do actually save multiple millions of dollars because you're not putting customers in a situation where they can never get themselves out of. And, and that problem is accentuated in Los Angeles because we have bundled billing. Right. So people see their DWP bill, they blame you for it, even though chunks of that are two months worth of sanitation and, and everything else. So, um, so I think that problem will be even worse here. Or the improvement will be even more here than it would be in that Illinois case. Um, the estimated bill situation. I learned something today when you talked about the ongoing process of estimating bills, because I've got to be candid with you, I didn't know you estimated bills until I called a month ago in response to my own bill, and by the way, was on hold for 40 minutes, um, and when I spoke to the, to the customer service representative then, I found out that my bill had been estimated. That was the first I knew about this. So. I've learned about why you've done that, and I, it makes sense that, again, when you're transferring from one system to another, that there's going to have to be some of that just because you, you can't go through your normal process of data collection when you're shifting from system to system. I get that. But I do have to say, uh, I, don't, I think the public outreach on this was sorely lacking. 
and um, knowing that this was coming, and in fact this system should have been up and running in November of 2012, that was the target date for this to be up and running, knowing that this was coming, the department should have engaged in a much more robust effort to inform the public that you might see an estimated bill, and it might be wildly divergent from what you're used to, don't panic, here's what we're going to do. And that was not done at all. I didn't know that there was going to be estimated billing, and I'm a councilman. Nobody in my staff knew that there was going to be estimated billing. So, um, you know, maybe we just all missed it. But if we missed it, certainly the members of the public couldn't have been expected to, to know this. So um, I have to say that was someplace where, where we really fell way short of the mark. Um, okay, now I wanted to talk a little bit about hold time. That was, and you've covered a lot of it, and, and the data here is, is very, very instructive and useful. Sir Corey, uh, can I yes. ask a question on point, Sure. The chair? Well, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Point uh, since people are calling presumably all our offices and, and volume asking about these, do you actually want the information that a particular person is being charged higher or would you prefer that they just be told that they were paying an estimate and this will correct through the process? What answer would, would you like council offices ideally to be giving you? I mean, be giving the, the customer so that they're directed in terms of their interaction with you. I share may have other thoughts, but I would certainly think we'd want to know about it immediately and get it solved. So I would have them go ahead and call us. Okay, so you'd rather address it rather than yeah. have it cycle through the system and be right, addressed. Or, or, or you know, since it's coming from a council office, you know, definitely email us and we can get it to, so they don't have to get on the phone. If they've already con called you and contacted you, and I don't want them to have to turn around and go back through the same process. Right, so so they would know all, we have to email the information and that'll be taken care of. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. As long as they have the service address, it's very helpful. We can handle it. Mr. Corn. Thank you. Um, so on hold time, if you look at slide 14, we see that the biggest part of the problem happened uh, after the handoff to the new system, understandably. But you also see that for the first four or five months of the year, wait time was substantially higher than it had been in the prior two years as well, and that was before there was any new system. So are there lessons that we can learn from that fact? Why was that going on? And, you know, how does that inform your choice of solutions uh, for bringing those call, uh, wait times down? Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I think it, it is something that we are aware of, and the reason why I think it, if you're talking in particular the month of August, uh, I, I think is the data point you're looking at. Is that correct? No, I, I, I can understand the last three months because that's post-transition uh -huh. to the new system, and you had all these estimated bills. Right, right. And you had, I mean, there was a crisis situation. Sure. People were calling. But if you also look at the, the rest of the year, throughout the year, uh, 2013 has been much worse than 2012 or 2011. And the, the driver behind that, thanks for clarifying that, the driver behind that principally is any, invariably when you go through a, a system conversion of the magnitude that we did, you often have to pull uh, valuable resources to help with the business design, the, the, the functionality of the system to get, it, to get it function the way that you want to. So it's principally, not, not uh, exclusively, but principally driven because we had to take some of those valued customer service representatives off the phone and to work on the project to get the, the functionality the way that we want it. And, and now that they are and trained. And training, okay. And, and now we're returning those folks back to the contact center and we're getting back to, to full staffing there. Okay, so that's, that's, you assume that's aberrational and that will subside as training continues and okay so now if you look at slide 12 um, this is interesting because there seem to be um, particular days in this where there are especially dramatic spikes much of this time period it's pretty consistent with past past time frame but there's just a you know about a quarter of the days when it's much much higher and I'm just wondering if there's any lesson to be learned from, from that. What happened that caused those dramatic spikes? Has, that, has there been any analysis? Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, and Sharon can, can uh, 
add some additional comments as well. But you know, generally speaking, what we see, and I think what the data shows, is Mondays are always uh, a higher volume day. Uh, but that would have been true in prior years too. Yeah. And what I'm saying is the discrepancy between uh, those spikes and and the prior year it just seems to be especially dramatic on a few days. But mm -hmm. most of the time, it's pretty consonant with the with the curve of the prior year. Right, right, right. I don't know if you had any other thoughts other than it's, you know, our billing cycles are different, sending out different number of bills uh, throughout the month, so that may attribute to some of that. Well, I, I, some of the, well, the, some of the spikes, and of course the spikes are all the 2013 spikes, the ones this year. Um, we, we actually, as, as Campbell was talking through some of those issues, we did have, I don't know if this is a, I'm from the Midwest, but it's like the pig and the python. Like we would have, we would find a problem, we would discover the problem, and the problem would work itself through the system. For example, when we discovered the problem about those meter reads that Matt referred to getting stuck in a table and then flowing through the system, there's three cycle days that had been bunched up that then, then went ahead and got released into the system. So then you have customers in, in these chunks of time that all got bills on the same day that normally would have been spread out, out across three days. I see. And so that was, the, that was one of our pig and the pythons. I don't know if that's okay. the expression. And then just the next, from the same pig, the next bump really is 19 or 21 days later. If people haven't paid their bill, they get a late notice. Oh, okay. So if there was a big bump because we unstuck some things and generated 100,000 bills instead of 40,000 on a day, 19 days later, whatever percentage of that 100,000 comes back through, now gets a, a late payment notice, you get a, oftentimes get a second spike. Gotcha. Um, two more quick points, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could. The, the one is we, we've, we have a lot of data here on uh, hold time for the call centers. Uh, we don't have any data on service given at in person at the customer service windows. Mm -hmm. um, and I know my office has received a lot of anecdotal complaints from constituents that um, long lines, lines out the door, two people serving uh, at the windows when there's eight open, you know, a lot of that is anecdotal, I know, and nobody ever says, oh, it's, it was great, they were all fully staffed, they only call in when, when they weren't. But have you gathered any data on that, and, and you don't need to give it now, but if you could report uh, on that as well, and whatever changes uh, in managing the workforce may na need to be made to ensure that that process is more customer friendly as well. Certainly. Okay. Uh, final point is, um, especially given that there have been these incidents of people with dramatically higher than normal bills, um, estimated billing, significant number of complaints, uh, slower process in being able to resolve some of those complaints, uh, what is the department doing to ensure that people uh, are not put into collections or have their power and water cut off uh, when they are really being kind of victimized by the system uh, rather than being irresponsible? What, what can we do to ensure that somebody with a fixed income isn't going to lose their power because their bill quadrupled and they can't afford to pay it? Right. So in, in the cases, we, do, we have continued, because this is a lesson learned um, from utilities that have put in new systems and then n decided not to take any credit action for months and months um, after the system goes in. We tried to start relatively quickly. I think it was six or seven weeks in when we started resuming collections activities, but they're all manually processed. We're very, very careful about collections activities so that none of these customers are affected at all. These are, these are long-time chronic collection credit customers, and each one of them is signed off by a manager before it's sent out to the field. So we've, we put in a couple extra um, processes to make sure that these types Great. of customers aren't affected by them. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, so in terms of, um, uh, so let's say you have a customer who has, uh, you know, a, a, a larger bill than they're expected to, would it be okay when they call in that they actually just read their own meter and give you the information? 
Yes, we do accommodate that today. Absolutely. Okay, very good. So, so that is something that, uh, Mr. Koretz, I think our offices, Mr. Kokori, Mr. Labonge, that if we get calls um, that, you know, obviously we email you all and, and, and do that, but we need to sort of let the public know that they can take their information and just report it to you. Um, so this way they have their estimate given to you. So we, you all would accept that, right? They, yes. they can even take a picture with their cell phone, and we would, we would take a picture of a cell phone of their meter. Very good. That's easier. that's the, the amazing part of technology. Now, I, I, I want to come back to the monthly building, billing for a second because I feel like I need to defend the, the motion a little bit here. I, I think separate and, and above from the convenience, which I think is important for our customers, speak to sort of industry standards and does this begin to help us get on the path of demand pricing and eventually demand control? Because I think ultimately... Uh, there are ways for us to implement this uh, in the near term. I, uh, now that we understand that estimations are used uh, largely in the field, uh, absent these sort of hiccups and an introduction of a new platform, it's my impression that with experience you could do pretty good estimates on a 30-day basis and true up every other month uh, so we can get onto this type of system faster. But it seems to me that we have to tie back to the meter uh, very quickly. So uh, multi-pronged here, what is the status of the deployment of these uh, meters that are capable, to, capable of doing this sort of thing? I don't know if they are quote-unquote smart meters, but it seems to me that is sort of the genesis of this billing problem as well. So where are we uh, on meters uh, system-wide, and, and what needs to be done for us to be able to give you all the capability to, to, to move uh, our, our residents into a 30-day and hopefully smarter usage pattern, uh, more on the demand uh, sort of uh, side of things? Well, it, I mean, moving to smart meters is a, is a big undertaking. Um, at this point, we have some in for commer some of our large commercial customers, and then we have the sort of pilot as part of the grant that is targeted to put out 50,000 and really start giving us some experience over the next couple of years with how do, you, how do you operate those, what do you have to support, um, what can we start doing with those reads um, to make it a more viable system. When you start talking about demand response, you start talking about more time of use billing and really making that uh, very viable for conservation. You really need the smart meter out there. Um, even there, you know, we, we have tiered rates, and there's some concern with our tiers about estimation. If we can, as we get the system stabilized, see what the estimation, if we feel that the estimation process has really gotten pretty solid, then maybe that two month. You know, two-month read, one-month estimate could be looked at in some in some ways. It's it's not uncommon for some utilities to do that, but you know where everybody's driving is much more granular data, and that requires a smart meter. We have 1.5 million analog meters out there, so it's not going to be a rapid process to to replace them. Um, but the department is really trying to get good lessons learned from this pilot and be able to come in and talk about what it takes to do smart meters, what do we think the benefits would be, what are we actually seeing in terms of customer behavior where we have those meters, and be able to have a, a reasonably good discussion about that and how it fits in L.A. Mr. LeBonge, did you have any questions? Oh, just a question. Uh, in comparison to the gas company or uh, the Edison company, you go to international conferences or statewide conferences. Uh, do they you ever talk about this with them? I know they're not direct competitors, but often, the utilities. Often. I mean, uh, you know, Edison put in about 5 million uh, smart meters. Uh, yes. They, re they fully replaced their entire meter uh, system with smart meters. It was a big and expensive project. I was prior to coming to the department, I was with Southern California Edison and worked on the uh, Edison Smart Connect project, which was their advanced metering initiative, where they, as Matt just alluded to, replaced 5 million residential and small commercial uh, meters. Um, and it does, as you correctly pointed out, really sets the foundation for 
uh, of a variety of demand response and energy efficiency conservation based measures as well as other opportunities to gain operational efficiency no question and what's our plan and I'm sorry I was out uh, we currently have a, a small pilot that I think Matt can speak to about 50,000 uh, meters currently um, and beyond that Matt and Sharon can add to that yeah at this point I mean the department really is wanting to to spend a little time seeing the results from that 50,000 before we come, walk in here with a project that really ex would accelerate meter replacement. I mean, meter, we replace meters um, on a cycle now that's a very long cycle. And so it would be in normal course, even if we were to say, okay, we're just not going to put any more dumb meters in. They're all going to be smart meters that we're going to put in starting now. I think it's a 10 or 12 year cycle to replace those meters. And there's a lot of additional work you have to do besides replacing the meter. You need some infrastructure for those signals to come back. You need some infrastructure for how you're uh, processing all that extra data because there's a lot more data that comes in. Um, and that's why we want to run the pilot first for a little while to see, to really be able to come in with a good picture of what it's going to take. But you see that across a lot of the industry. Um, and when, you know, a lot of the people who um, are really doing, getting a lot of good recognition on some of the customer side activities is because they have that level of data and they can share that level of data with their customers. Yeah, I just think for the department and having some familiarity with the department, you should start one part of the city on the corner and move in and just, you know, if you start in... Uh, Silmar. Silmar. No, I, I think Sunland to Hunger, then go west. Sunland to Hunger. Sunland to Hunger. Either one, any one of the S's. And just, just come through, because if we don't make a commitment to do it, we're not going to do it. <clears throat> DWP used to have the oldest trucks in the fleet because you didn't change them to... They broke down. And that's probably a good thing, except... It breaks down. Now we're getting older. We got to. We really should have. Really should have a plan. The other thing too, as far as uh, knowledge, now in a home in 1950, in a home there would be a refrigerator, maybe a washing machine, uh, a television, and that's and a toaster. And that's about it. Now there's so many much much more. Like I wonder what the bill is at the airport for people who plug in their iPads or their cell phones in the <laughs> sockets, and they put a lot of those sockets in the new Tom Bradley uh, extension, but. I think you have to educate the community more in that, in simple, not small print in the bill, but something that is very simple to how to reduce the cost for you, the consumer, on that. So I, public information is so important, and I know that's sometimes the first thing and they cut, public information, public affairs, but you've got to be out there a little more. Even the information on your trucks you put out, which is very good, the little side uh, placard. So... We're going to get more report on this, right, Mr. Chair? Absolutely, because information is... Knowledge is and power, knowledge is and power. you get your power from the DWP. So uh, before we wrap up on items 1, 2, 3, and 4, help me understand the, the contractor, your plan, give me sort of the schedule to address some of the, the, the challenges that we're hearing about, because it's good to know that uh, we're going to true up the, the impact. Bad to know that it's really lumpy. We're going to have some folks out there who are paying this much, which is a lot, and then when we true up, they won't pay as much, but that is difficult in, in, in most of the households that I represent. So how, is, how, how are you and the contractor? It's good to know that you've got senior management on it, but ultimately the patch is going to have to be a combination of your expertise in the field to uh, quickly regain the experience as to where these meters are so we don't have to rely on estimates or worse, rule three. Um, what's the plan to, to deploy those sort of strategies? Give me a schedule. Give me 60 days of what's going to happen so that we get as uh, rule out the lumps and get as smooth as possible. I think uh, broadly speaking, over the next 60 days, it, it's really going to be an emphasis on some of the things I've already mentioned. It's going to be implementing the virtual hold to address or at least partially address the wait times to give the customers another option uh, to interact with us or to be a little bit more efficient with their day. Uh, secondly, it's going to be continuing to optimize, as Matt mentioned, the meter reading routing system so that every day when the, the meter readers come back, they have the, uh, the optimization points on their, uh, their chart or their report, and that continues to get optimized on a daily basis so that our routes, a higher percentage of our routes get completed. 
uh, daily so that we minimize estimates going forward. Again, as the, the, uh, the actual reads come in, uh, we're going to continue to have more historical information in the system so that uh, we don't have to rely upon uh, rule number three. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, train our customer service representatives on the functionality of the system. We're going to look to add uh, additional staff to the contact center. And then longer term, we're going to continue to work with the, with the contractor, our system integrator, to continue to address the root cause of some of the functionality that we need to get addressed. And some of that, again, those, those things are happening every day as we speak. We're, sure. we're working those and closing those every day. And I do believe over the next you know, 30, 60, 90 days, we will continue to see uh, progress towards stabilizing the system. Uh, but again, longer term to get it finely tuned, uh, it, it's going to take a, a little bit longer as industry standard, as Sharon said, is 18 to 24 months. But by no means are we expecting customers to wait that long because uh, things are going to get better, and they are getting better every day, every week, every month. Sure. And uh, when is the next billing cycle start? So we're in, so we've been through, so everybody has, all, resi all commercial customers get read and billed every month. So we're talking about the residential customer group. And we've been through um, basically every working day. So there's like 42 or 43 cycle days. And, and any customer could have any one of those cycle days. So every customer's been through an entire billing cycle once. And we're starting the second billing cycle, the 1 through 43 billing cycle so we're when coming does, up. When does that start? What's day it's one? It's every day. Okay. So every day we read and bill and read and bill. But and if, you, if you think about it, the first cycle we did in the new system was right. around September 3rd. So 60 right. days later, okay. November 3rd, we started our first, our, really the first, first time we're, we're re going back to right. places we went in the new system. Right? And January 3rd, or roughly there, it, it, you know, we, we get... Now, then we're going to places where they had two rounds of corrections and tunings on the read cycles. Okay. I, I ask because, and if it's okay with my colleagues, um, you know, would like to have you all communicate with my office. Um, coming from an IOU world, I imagine that you have some metrics and expectations as to sort of how we're going to chop at this problem. And I would love to know uh, how we're doing um, sort of in the next, you know, 25, 45 days. But more so if there's um, information that we need to get out to our constituencies in the event that we have to call a special meeting to just sort of communicate to folks, hey, um, there's a bump coming or there's some things that you can do to mitigate it. But I do want to thank you for the, the reporting. I feel like I understand so much more than I did before as to what's happening and um, you know, there, there's going to be uh, hiccups. I, I just wish it wasn't this bad uh, because we have heard from folks. I, I believe, do we have cards, Mr. Pareto, on, on the issue? Actually, we do not, right? No. We don't. Okay, there are not. one, two, three, and four. There are no public comment cards. Members, unless you have any, uh, well, I, I've, I've heard from my constituents who are here, uh, so uh, as we all have. And um, uh, again, you know, just to make the announcement here, our folks who are having this experience ought to take a photo and call the, the Department of Water and Power, or call 311 to be warmly transferred over to the agency. Yeah, how, I, how does that work? I think I hear people complain you call 311, it's tough to get the DWP. Has anyone ever heard that complaint? That's a big complaint I heard right there. I'm so, going to try it right now. Very good. Mr. Labonge is yeah, going to go ahead and dial 311. We, we, that's right. Well, we had Mr. Englander uh, replay for us uh, how it goes. Uh, Tom, let us know how that goes. You all will be in the audience because we may have to call you back, uh, depending on what, uh, the outcome of this. Uh, Mr. Prieto, can we go to item number five? Sir, uh, with respect to item number five, it relates to a Bureau of Sanitation report in response to motion, Bloomfield and Cedillo, relative to the status of the recycling programs or requirements for multifamily apartment complex. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, Mr. Blumenfield asked me to yeah. hold this item yeah. because he is not uh, available and this is his motion. So uh, my apologies. Um, item, it's a great staff work, bad council member. No, no, no. I was about item to number... Uh, item number six. Number six. CRO report relative proposed supplemental agreement with waste management, Barry Landfill and Recycling Center for the processing of residential green material. We have staff from the CAO and uh, Bureau of Sanitation. That's why we got these gavels. Very good. Item number six. Good afternoon, Councilmember Wilson Poon from the CAO's office. 
Uh, item six on the agenda is a sale. Let me close this out. Long wait customer service line committee uh, when 311 transfers. So it, long wait, but it, but it does transfer you to, to DWP. Yes. Right. All right. It's a long wait, which is why we're going to, uh, they're, they're, they're working on it. Very good. I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. Uh, item six is a CAO report, which is recommending that the council authorize the Bureau of Sanitation to execute a proposed uh, modified supplemental agreement to its contract with waste management uh, to process the city's residential green materials. Uh, the city collects about 1,800 tons per day of green material, 400 of these tons are processed by city facilities, and the remaining 1,400 is processed by uh, contractors. Um, the existing contract is expired last month, and the supplemental agreement will basically extend it for an additional two, two years to allow the Bureau sufficient time to execute a new contract. Um, as I mentioned, we are proposing, we are recommending two modifications. Um, the first is to increase the two-year costs from $35 million to $41 million and the total contract ceiling from about $119 million to $143 million. This is to reflect the additional tonnage that waste management will be taken on as a result of the city not extending its contract with uh, community recycling. So it's, it's an increase in contracting, but uh, from a volume perspective, we're just transferring what the previous contractor was getting, and we're moving that sort of difference over to waste management who can better handle the... Correct. They were processing, I believe, 400 tons a day out of the 1,400 that the contractors were processing. So um, sufficient funds are available within the Solid Waste Resources Revenue Fund to support the first-year costs. Uh, Second-year costs will have to be budgeted and provided in the city's uh, annual budget process. Um, as I said, uh, our office is recommending that the council authorize the Bureau to execute the supplemental agreement as modified. Very good. Uh, did you all have any testimony in support? Javier Polanco, Division Manager, LA Sanitation. Uh, the only thing I'd like to add is that um, the supplemental is just an interim process and that we have an RFP uh, that was released and we have proposals that we're evaluating and uh, we'll return to this committee with an authority to execute those contracts coming out of those negotiations within about 18 months. So, uh, so uh, 18 months from now you think we'll have that round of RFPs? All executed. Very good. And can you just help us understand sort of what type of materials are collected under the uh, co proposed contract extension, and where are they delivered to? These, the, um, the material that's collected is from our residential curbside collection program, and it's the material that goes into the green uh, container. So it's uh, yard trimmings, basically, that go in, into that uh, container. And uh, the, the distribution, um, the way it works, uh, we have um, the rec hall that goes um, from the valley to the Bradley facility at waste management, and then some gets transferred from Clarts, um, our, our own transfer station that we operate from the uh, north central and south LA um, waste sheds over to Bradley, and uh, that, that's how it's transferred. And we use those same transfer the same transfer station for the west LA material as well. Very good. Uh, Mr. Kretz or Mr. Labonge with questions? Okay. Uh, All right, hearing and seeing none, I want to thank you for your. Uh, Presentation, that item is unanimously out of committee. Item number seven. Number seven is a very similar contract, CO report, as well as Bureau Sanitation, relative supplemental agreements for Best Way Recycling Company, City Fibers, and CR&R. Uh, good afternoon. Once again, uh, item seven on today's agenda is uh, CO report, again, recommending that the council authorize the Bureau to execute supplemental agreements to three of its uh, six uh, MRF contracts. These are the uh, the, the MRFs that process uh, the city's uh, residential uh, recyclable materials or the materials from the blue bins for the Harbor, North Central, and the West Valley waste sheds. Um, these contracts are expiring next month, and again, we're asking the supplemental agreements will basically extend the contracts for an additional two years to allow the Bureau sufficient time to execute new contracts. Um, these are revenue generating contracts, so all the revenues that we collect from the sale of the recyclables are deposited into the landfill maintenance special trust fund, which supports basically landfill or post closure maintenance activities at the city's landfills. Um, each of the MRFs have also, um, 
I guess, uh, pledge to contribute uh, manual contributions to support the city's ambassador program, which um, basically utilizes public outreach and education to kind of reduce contamination rates in the blue bins. Um, I also wanted to point out in previous meetings, um, your committee had requested, had expressed some concerns and also requested some information about um, overseas markets where we sell our recyclables and whether those um, were being you know, processed in an environmentally responsible manner. Um, the Bureau had reported that uh, in the current RFP that um, MERS will be required to disclose where they sell their recyclables. And I believe the Bureau also has future plans to also do site inspections to verify that they are being uh, processed as a, in an environmentally responsible manner. So, um, again, this use of revenue generating contracts. The city is no, under no financial obligation under these contracts. Um, we receive about $2.6 million in annual revenues into the Landfill Maintenance uh, Special Trust Fund and about 108000 to support the ambassador program. Um, our office is, again, recommending that the council authorize the Bureau to execute these supplemental agreements. When was the last time this set of contracts was competitive? And um, understanding that you're asking for a two-year uh, supplemental agreement, is that so that we can create a competitive process again? I, I, I don't – I think there's a lot of value in, in uh, having competition, maybe not as soon as uh, – as, uh, maybe not on a, on a very strict timetable, but help me understand sort of when it was competitive last and why are we extending for two years before it's competitive again? Well, right now we have uh, – we're expecting proposals to come back on December 2nd, so we did part of an RFP um, out on the street, and uh, we're, we're receiving proposals on December 2nd. And uh, the last time it went out to RFP, I think, was in uh, 2006? 2007. Okay, so you're currently in a competitive process right. for currently in the competitive two years from now? Yeah, we're, we're going to – we plan to execute the, the co contracts for the proposals that are out on the street now that we, we're going to get on d December 2nd. We're, we oh, want to execute those within 18 yeah. months. Okay. Very good. Mr. Kretz? Yeah, am I hearing right that the recycling revenue goes to the landfill maintenance fund? Yes, it does. That's, that's correct. Does that not seem counterintuitive? Well, uh, absolutely we, not. If you see, if you've been to uh, Toyon Canyon, if you've been to Lopez Canyon, if you've been to Sheldon Canyon uh, or Sheldon Landfill, they, they just abandon them. And without this money, we don't have any landscaping or equestrian trails. I'll show you. It's not like they're sitting on gold. Uh, they got to do so. You did Bishop's Canyon, That's Red correct. Reyes, or Mike Hernandez. You did, correct, it's significant because if you don't. So landfill there, maintenance, this is. Yeah, these are for the, the closed the, the landfills. Closed landfills. Yeah, these closed landfills that the city maintains, they have landfill gas collection systems that need routine maintenance, and uh, the grounds and the uh, cover also need maintenance on a, on a routine basis, so we, we control any kind of emissions. You know, there's settlement at the landfill, and we have to do uh, continual grading, so we, we keep uh, good drainage on, on the landfills. So we're, yeah, there's, so there's a tremendous there's a lot amount of maintenance maintain. involved. Uh, Lopez Canyon, for example, and what they're doing, in addition to the maintenance of the closed landfill, the composting facility there is is is, is incredible. Oh, thank you, sir. So, the, do we have kind of permanent expenses associated with closed landfills? It continues as long as there's landfill gas being produced, and uh, it uh, it continues to be produced, and even still, it you know it, it'll settle. Uh, there'll still be settlement at the landfill and, and grading, grading work to do uh, on a continual basis indefinitely. Interesting. Thank you. It's the uh, Toyon Canyon and Griffith Park opened in the 50s, closed in 85, still operational. Little methane coming out now, still unsettling, but uh, there's much more work to do, but you can't do it until it fully settles and keep that money where it belongs us. There won't be anything to do. Yeah, lots of compaction. Yeah, and some of these are city-owned canyons like Bishop Canyon. Uh, Lopez. Also, but also in your district, Paul, or well, it used to be your district before redistricting, I think, or maybe with Marvin Browdy's, all the, uh, on the Mountain hills. Gate, Mountain yeah. Gate, which was a county landfill. That was a field. county, yeah, mission, county mission, right. Yeah. That's correct. Very good. Any additional questions, members? I actually have one, one more on, on the subject. Should the, there be some sort of a decommissioning fund the way they have for San Onofre once it's shut down, that now they, they have funds set aside to... Uh, deal with the waste and deal with shutting it down. With the uh, landfill? Yeah, should there not be something like that attached to uh, all of these uh, 
old uh, abandoned landfills. Well, the uh, post post closure funding that comes from the uh, revenue from the recyclables, we, we we think that there's sufficient funds there to to cover any type of decommissioning should there be any decommissioning. Because what we do is constantly maintain the landfill and have to do you know uh, minor upgrades to the collection system, and so. I can't foresee that we would decommission a landfill gas system for a while. Um, like at Lopez, it's generating gas, which generates power. So we're, we're selling the, using landfill gas for, for energy. But at one time, maybe in the much distant future, we'll have to de decommission. Okay, thank you. Very good. Uh, hearing and seeing no additional questions, that item is uh, deemed approved from the committee. Thank you. Item number eight. Mr. Chair, item number eight is also, uh, we have a continuous request from the Bureau of Sanitation. If That's right. Uh, very good. All right. Well, that, uh, are there any speaker cards, Mr. Preto? No, there are not. Very good. That brings our meeting to a close. Thank you. Yeah. Do it again.